Hello, and welcome to Humanities Matter, brought to you by Brill. I am Emily Tampkin, and this week we will be looking at key issues in the field of humanities. I'm speaking today with Sanisha Vukovic and Diane Burnaby. They are the authors of Refining Intractability, a case study of entrapment in the Syrian civil war in international negotiation. Um, Professor Vukovic is a senior lecturer of conflict management and global policy at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And Diane Burnaby is the senior academic programs coordinator at the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs. Um, Sanisha and Diane, thank you both so much for taking some time to speak with me today. We're happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Great. So um, to start out, you say that in your paper, you are, quote, refining intractability, end quote. And to start out, how do you think intractability is normally defined? And how does your paper refine, as you say, or challenge or uh, rework that definition? Intractability as such in itself has uh, a series of qualities that previous scholarship has been unpacking in a very uh, effective way. And for all conflicts that have bear that quality, so uh, starting with protraction, continuing with polarized solutions, uh, following on with uh, very well-defined entrenched identities, zero-sum identities, we can easily spot these types of conflicts around the globe. Now, uh, to better understand intractability, one needs to know that uh, intractability has both characteristics and also uh, uh, significant uh, stages that define the level and the quality of intractability. Uh, one of the things that uh, always comes to mind is that escalation in itself becomes a means to an end to advance uh, a unilateral solution onto one's opponent and to use that escalation not to get to the point in which the parties are going to get exhausted of the conflict, but in which the conflict becomes actually self-serving and becomes normalized. So what I've just described are uh, several uh, characteristics of, uh, of intractability that traditionally scholarship and policymakers have taken into account when defining something uh, as an intractable conflict. Um, I don't only want to ask you guys to to define words uh, for the duration of this podcast, but I do think that listeners might have one understanding of what the word entrapment means. Um, mm-hmm. And so I was hoping that in this context, you could explain what you mean by entrapment and what that has to do with intractability. Um, yeah. Entrapment, in fact, is something that we bring to the whole discussion about intractable conflicts. And the reason why we're bringing entrapment to the discussion is because we have seen Uh, this term being used very loosely, very uh, in in a very liberal way uh, to define all sorts of conflicts that seem very difficult to manage. And um, uh, if you if you go through the paper we wrote, we kind of give this uh, observation with direct quotations in which we kind of see how policymakers with very uh, 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 strong tendency to define intractability, they went through all sorts of conflicts that potentially may not be so difficult to manage. They, 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 they were destructive in nature, they were uh, difficult to uh, uh, comprehend and then to assign an adequate management strategies, but in, in, in themselves they are definitely not intractable in a practical sense of the word. So what we're contributing to the whole uh, discussion is by introduction of this dynamic which oftentimes it gets overlooked, and that is how do people get stuck in a conflict? And we term it as entrapment um, to people, meaning parties, conflicting parties. And entrapment is something that conceptually becomes uh, an integral part of these stages, how conflicts evolve over time and precedes the main quality of intractability, and that is the routinization and normalization of conflict. So, Entrapment in, in itself is kind of a, a slippery slope to uh, protraction. It's, it's, it's this intention to justify over-investing in a conflict. It's this intention to rationalize costs. It's this acceptance of destruction as the only way to deal with a problem. It might be helpful in understanding the definition of the term 
to understand its historical background as being born out of the um, economic behavioral theory discipline. So in behavioral studies, entrapment is this idea of continuing to invest in a failing course of action in order to vindicate sunk costs. And um, in order to bring that to life, I think it's it's interesting to mention um, a few vignettes that two authors named Joel Brockner and Jeffrey Rubin, who were part of the original conceptualization of this theory in international relations, used in the introduction to a book they wrote called Entrapment in Escalating Conflicts, which are sort of meant to help apply this theory to everyday life. One of them is you have an old car whose parts you have been continually replacing. Do you Mm -hmm. keep buying cheap parts or do you invest in a new car? At what point do you make the decision to invest? Another vignette that I think might be helpful to sort of put yourself in that situation of that entrapping sensation is you've been waiting for a bus or the subway or a metro for 20 minutes and you're late to work or an appointment and you can walk to where you're going and you know that at some point the bus will come. Do you walk or do you wait? Do you have no idea how long it will take, but do you walk or do you wait? And being able to identify those things in our everyday lives that's entrapment. And Mm -hmm. what the point of our paper was really was to look at how that sensation can be applied to the way decision makers or policymakers might feel or behave in a crisis or conflict scenario. I assume you're going to ask how we did that with the series of civil war. That is exactly where I was going. Um, (laughs) Yes. So moving from, from the bus station or from your your uh, your broken down car to the Syrian civil war, which is the case study of, of in this paper, and you write in the abstract that what's largely missing is a nuanced explanation of at what point resistance turns into intractability. And Sanisha, you were saying that it can be difficult in a conflict to identify that point, right? So in the case of the Syrian civil war, but at what point was it people are just waiting at this bus stop? Just to simplify things. Um, what yeah. we, we were actually saying uh, in our paper is, in fact, that uh, resistance to any type of compromise may be the symptom of these intractable and difficult conflicts resistant to any type of change. Mm-hmm. However, what we are also trying to uh, highlight in, 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 in using the Syrian case as an example is to say that just the mere resistance to compromise, just the mere resistance to any type of negotiation in itself is not enough to think about conflicts as intractable or even um, uh, that they're in the entrapment uh, uh, phase. Entrapment has that type of uh, tension that parties are not considering compromise as a viable option. So I'm not going to walk because I will continue doing what I've been doing so far. I will just wait for the bus. I will not buy a new car. I will continue doing what I've been doing, and that is buying cheap parts and just kind of patching up things uh, while they while they while they uh, still hold. So the idea is to continue on the original strategy, even though you have objective indicators that things are not going the way you planned. And we use the case of Syria just to say that. Syria, even though it has been described by policymakers, by academics, by media, as an intractable conflict that cannot be resolved, and it's so difficult because of the sheer amount of destruction and the sheer amount of tensions that arose over the past uh, nine years, we are saying, well, it, things are not so difficult because it did not get it, the conflict did not go through all of the necessary phases that will make it uh, eventually intractable. It's still not too late to reverse the trend. And this is basically where we get to answer the original question, and that is what needs to be done in order to reverse the trend that leads conflicts such as the Syrian one into intractability. There's a few, as a case study, there's a few reasons why the Syrian civil war lends itself well to understanding and illustrating entrapment as a theory. Um, First, it just 
very clearly exemplifies a lot of the characteristics that we've identified in entrapping scenarios. There are mm -hmm. subjects that engage in some sort of goal-directed behavior. They're unsuccessful in their initial attempt to attain that goal. They experience conflict about the prudence of escalating their commitment. Maybe their objective is farther away than they expected, or their investments are not as powerful as they anticipated. They have a choice about whether to escalate their commitment. They prob the probability of goal attainment is uncertain to them. And in the Syrian civil war, the them, they, the players that we're looking at predominantly are the United States and Russia. And um, we're looking at this relationship solely in the paradigm of the civil war and not necessarily involving any sort of counter-terror, counter-ISIS sort of campaign. But just looking at that dynamic, we see the phases of entrapment come to life over the first nine years of the conflict, there's this initial phase of reward pursuit where each party identifies an objective for Russia and Iran that is supporting the Assad regime and keeping Assad in power. For the United States, the Obama administration, that is literally announcing for the sake of the Syrian people, the time has come for President Assad to step aside, which was an announcement he released in, in, two, in August of 2011. Mm -hmm. But then there's this phase of cost justification where we see each party continue to escalate and entrench themselves in their initial positions over time. And in all entrapping scenarios, that's really characterized by this decision-making process that's bent on proving a political good sense to that previous investment, to that or initial reputational investment in the conflict by, by choosing and backing aside. Um, and it's a very escalatory phase by nature. So in the Syrian civil war, this began with the U.S. making a lot of reputational and diplomatic investments and in backing the the rebel forces. They levied sanctions against the Assad regime. They joined a coalition of 100 countries that recognized the, the National Council, this, this body of um, different militia groups that gave them legitimacy. Secretary Clinton began negotiations in the UN-led Geneva process, organizing language that she believed would recognize a transitional government that would remove Assad from power. On the other side, you have Iran and Russia continuing to escalate their involvement in the conflict. Iran extended a $3.6 billion line of credit to the Assad regime. Um, between 2012 and 2013, Assad used chemical weapons, notably. Russia blocked arms boycotts in the UN um, Security Council. So there was a lot of escalation in this preliminary phase of the war where you had these outside sponsors backing the, their proxies on the ground. Um, and those escalations were very significant. What is interesting, though, is that during that period of time, we had a negotiation process to look at that served as evidence of how entrenched each party was in their position and so how confident they felt that they would achieve their goal. And I'm particularly talking about the Geneva process, Geneva 1 and 2, and the Geneva communique that was born out of, of the, the first phase of the Geneva process, where the U.S. and Russia starkly disagreed over the interpretation of language about whether or not the Assad regime would be part of a transitional government. And you had the United States refusing to accept um, that he would, and you had Russia refusing to accept that he wouldn't. And they were both very, there was a very, um, we call this the zone of possible agreement. There was no zone of possible agreement around how this language could be interpreted during that point mm -hmm. in time. But a series of, of incidents happened that really changed the balance in the conflict. And this brings us to a phase of turning points that in an entrapment we identify as this punishment and loss minimization phase where a more entrapped party will begin to recede from the conflict because they realize the failing trajectory of their investments. And that's that, in this case, would be the United States realizing that there was no longer, it was, it was no longer worth their investments to continue to stay so engaged in the war. Whereas you had 
another party that felt like it was closer to its objective and was willing to invest more, um, more willing to continue to increase and make those investments. So you have Putin completely um, changing the balance of power in the region. He invaded Crimea. He ended chemical weapons negotiations with the United States. He increased troops in Syria on the ground to 2,000 people. Um, Whereas the United States and its allies were in a very different position, feeling like they didn't want to continue to invest in this conflict for a variety of other reasons. Um, Mm -hmm. They didn't want to exacerbate the migration crisis in Europe. They felt like they wanted to decouple their involvement in the Syrian civil war from the final stages of the JCPOA negotiation. And of course, they felt like they had to redirect their efforts from removing Assad from power to countering ISIS, which was a new threat born out of the preliminary phases of the war. So we reached this this new asymmetric part of the conflict where there's one party willing to invest more than the other. And again, parallel to this, we have a new set of peace efforts that again allow us to measure how confident states are in their ability to achieve their original objective. And by this point in the war, we have the tail end of the Geneva process and the Astana process, which was completely under the auspices of Russia and Iran. It was convened under the auspices of Russia and Iran. And it was the first negotiation process that had the political objective of creating a new government with Assad in place, Mm -hmm. which shows this massive shift in what states' parties were willing to accept from a negotiation process with two parties that were unwilling to um, allow an overlap in their zone of possible agreement to a negotiation process that fell squarely within the interests of the parties convening it, Russia and Iran, that did not include the other main party to the conflict, the United States, and that only recognized an outcome with their primary objective of keeping Assad in place. So you've been talking about how resistance can lead to intractability, and or to kind of borrow your parlance from the, the paper itself, um, Entrapment is a phase that, or it's a phase on the way to potential intractability, but it is not itself necessarily the same thing as intractability. Um, So a final question for you is how, and you were sort of just speaking about this, but just to put a finer point on it, um, what is the way back from intractability? So is it as simple as one side realizes the other side cares more, right? Is, is, is it, is it saying, you know what, I can't continue to spend money on this? Is it what stopped the Syrian conflict from, in your uh, analysis, becoming intractable, I guess is the question. And is that replicable in other cases of entrapment? So there are two ways to think about this. One mm-hmm. is exactly as you just described, and that is just to consider that your investment, uh, aggressive investment into the conflict, into your unilateral solutions, seems not to be yielding expected results. And, you you know, this realization may prompt you to start reconsidering your priorities and to kind of, instead of focusing on the prospective gains, to start focusing on the actual costs uh, uh, that you are experiencing in the, uh, in, in real time. Now, What is very important to understand using exactly Syrian case as an illustration is that the reason why this entire phase of getting stuck, getting entrapped in the conflict is a useful indicator of uh, uh, this burden that uh, the stage of entrapment carries with itself that may lead the parties into intractability gets complemented by another element that we deem a necessary condition uh, uh, for intractable conflicts, and that is the normalization of conflicts. So for some parties, the realization, like the, for the United States, the realization that they have been betting on the wrong horse, or they have been doing something that is not generating a desired outcome, uh, made it easy for the decision makers to start reconsidering if this is the right course of uh, actions to be taken and to get out of the conflict as quickly as possible. 
Others, on the other hand, started realizing, well, we might not be getting what we wanted in absolute terms, but we're still on the positive path because all of these investments are leading us hopefully, eventually, into the outcome we, we desire. We're talking about Russia. Now, this, this diverging path between Russia and, 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 and the United States gets them to another critical juncture, a critical point, where they have to start realizing whether or not it is beneficial to them to stay in this situation. And we're calling this the stage of institutionalization of conflict. Mm -hmm. This is the condition that we, we deem necessary for a conflict to become intractable, so that really the protraction can take full motion. What do we mean by it? It is the creation of underlining structures, support mechanisms, institutions, legal frameworks that consolidate the conflict, making it a way of life, making it a normal daily routine in which participating in the conflict is completely rational. It's something that we do. It's something who we are. It can be both seen on the local level, so within the community, and on the decision-making level in which conflict is the backdrop against all uh, against which all decisions are being made. So conflict is just a way of life, as we said. Now, Syria is still not in that phase, and this is what we're pointing out in the paper, because it still has not reached that point of institutionalization of the conflict, in which there is... Uh, there, in order to get out of the conflict, you need to deinstitutionalize it. You need to create entirely new institutions and systems and structures to get out of it. We're talking about uh, conflicts that may resemble, for instance, Kashmir, the conflict in Kashmir, or the conflict yeah. in Cyprus, or the conflict in Northern Ireland, the conflict in Bosnia to a certain degree. So we're talking about conflicts that have become entrenched because of the superseding institutional frameworks that have routinized conflict dynamics, narratives, perspectives, perceptions, priorities, and preferences by the parties. So you see, Syria, from our analysis, is still not there yet. And mm -hmm. it opens up the possibilities for the parties if they can understand the consequences to reverse their investments and not get stuck in a very protracted and difficult conflict to deinstitutionalize. I have been speaking with Sanisha Bukovic and Diane Burnaby. They are the authors of the really quite excellent paper, Refining Intractability, a case study of entrapment in the Syrian civil war, which you can find, and I encourage you to, um, can find in the publication International Negotiation. Sanisha and Diane, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and knowledge and insight today. Thank you, Emily. It was our pleasure. Thank you very much.